describe these with uh, secants and cosecants. And we have a couple of reciprocal identities somewhere around here. So we have secant inverse x equals cosecant inverse 1 over x. Right here, so we have a secant, and a secant inverse cose uh, cosine relationship and a cosecant inverse sine relationship. So let's use those to flip them around to So I'm going to use both of these two. And so we have cos inverse x is So we can rewrite this. Just swap x and 1 over x. Uh, if you want to, you can let y equal 1 over x and then just make that substitution out of there. So we have secant inverse, yeah, so let y equal 1 over x. Better partition this way off of there because we used use y there. Let y equal 1 over x. And we have secant inverse 1 over y equals cos inverse y. And we'll do the same thing down here with cosecant and sine. So we're going to get cosecant inverse 1 over y equals sine inverse y. Now you should be worried, oh no, what about when y equals 0? Uh, what about when y equals 0? Obviously 1 over 0 is not going to work out very well. What is sine inverse of zero? Zero? So that would correspond to, just looking at the graph right here, here's where sine of zero is zero would correspond to where cosecant is undefined. So you shouldn't be using uh, these at all when uh, you have zero in for x or y, either way you write it. All right, now using both of those right here, so cosine inverse x is secant inverse 1 over x, secant inverse yes. So we have sec inverse 1 over x equals pi over 2 minus sine inverse. We're going to sub that out for cosecant inverse 1 over x. And then do that same, let y equal 1 over x, and we'll swap these back in. Seek inverse y equals pi over 2 minus cosecant inverse y. There's the identity that we need. Probably could have gotten that a different way. Well, like most things in math, you can definitely get it a different way. It's just the way that I saw how to do it right there. So now we're going to use that down in our derivative. So all it is is going to be a cosecant inverse is pi over 2 minus secant inverse. So from here, derivative is super easy. It's going to be 0 minus our derivative for secant inverse, which is 1 over absolute value x times square root x squared minus 1. Same thing for secant, except it will be negative. All right, there's our cosecant inverse. Now I can absolutely write out a antiderivative for this. Every derivative, you get a free antiderivative. So we're going to move the operator to the other side as the antiderivative. 
So we cosecant inverse x, we need our plus c equals antiderivative negative 1 over absolute value x square root x squared minus 1 minus 1 dx. Turn it on to use, and I'm going to bring the negative to the cosecant side. So I want to make the antiderivative as simple as possible, just like we've been doing. And then turn the x's to use. And we'll take out those two absolute values in the antiderivative, but we're not going to use it anyways, so not such a big deal. All right, so on this one, we didn't gain any new form. It still looks just like 1 over u times square root u squared minus 1. So we don't gain a new form, so I'm not going to put this inside of a box. So there's only three antiderivatives that we picked up. The other three are basically repeats. So. Just going to go with the three. We got a secant inverse antiderivative cotangent. Wait. Uh oh. Extraneous. Okay, good. So extraneous. So a tangent inverse, and then somewhere there'll be a cosine inverse as well. No? Sine, Sine inverse. All right. Anybody their textbook today? <clears throat> Somewhere at the back of the chapter, there'll be a summary table of all this stuff in one spot. And we're almost out of chapter seven. The beginning of chapter eight has a really nice summary table at the beginning that has not just anti, not just inverse trig, antiderivatives. It'll also have the. What else did we do? It will have all the hyperbolic trig and whatever else, the natural logs, exponentials, all that stuff will be uh, in one table. So it'll have almost everything you need at one spot. So I think we are ready for, oh, so another thing your book uses, they do something slightly different. Maybe I will just summarize. Although I only have a sign inverse. I could make up the rest. All right. So your book, in your book's antiderivative, so antiderivative is going to look like integral du over square root a squared minus u squared. And this one will be sine inverse. And this will be a not equal to 0. Obviously, if a is 0, the right side doesn't make sense. But if a is 0, the left side, the you know, 0 minus u squared, you would just write that as square root negative u squared. Um, well, that negative wouldn't mess it up. But it looks very different if a is 0. So these forms work out when a is not 0. So that will be a sine inverse. Uh, we have a tan inverse, which should be du over a squared plus u squared equals tan inverse u over a plus c. And then the last one, I don't know if they're going to go with cosecant or secant, they'll probably go with the secant. So integral du over u square root u squared minus a squared. And do you have your book here? We check these real fast. I just want to make sure the a's are in the right spot. Tangent 
Secant. This, this will be in 7.6, like probably near the end of 7.6. Uh, we're going to go with the secant inverse to avoid a negative. I'm just worried that one of these has a 1 over a coefficient out front, and I don't want to miss that on these here. Uh, I have a feeling it's the secant inverse that probably has a 1 over a, a coefficient. All right, we're going to start doing some problems now. So first example, integral dx. So these example problems are where you need to wake up because this is where uh, your quizzes and midterm questions uh, come from. So the applications of everything we just went through in a painstaking manner. Ah, oh, and tangent inverse, okay. So the tangent inverse has a one over a, and the secant inverse has a one over a, and then the rest. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. I recommend when you make your formula page, you can make it out of the notes in class, but I strongly recommend you check it against your book because there's a chance I messed it up. There's a chance you wrote it down onto your paper wrong. And then there's a chance you copied onto your formula page wrong. So you played a game telephone and went through my brain to the board, and then the board to your paper, and then paper to your cheat sheet. Really good chance the negative's in the wrong spot. So I strongly recommend go through and check all these in the book. It takes you, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes tops to go check them. All right, dx over square root three minus four x squared. So the good news is we have all these derivative, antiderivative formulas right above. So which one is it? Sine inverse, tan inverse, sec inverse. One, two, or three. So it looks like it's one. It's definitely not three because there's no x hanging out outside. Definitely not three. Uh, there's no square root and tangent inverse. So process of elimination, it's sine inverse. And usually when I write down formulas, to example, use one of the formulas I just wrote down. So number one, what is wrong with uh, the way it's written? So there's two things that are wrong. One of them is the three it has to be something squared. So how do we turn three into something squared? So just square root, square it. So three is square root three squared. So that's how we're gonna get get around that problem. Wait, I need something squared. It needs to be written like that. It's true they're equal, but it needs to be the second version right there. Um, so a is gonna be square root three. What is the other problem? It doesn't look like minus u squared. It looks like minus four u squared. So we're going to do something pretty similar. We're going to write it as 2x whole thing squared. And that's going to be our u. So we need to go let u equal 2x. Uh, so we write it integral. So I'm going to not make any u sub yet. I'm going to write it in a good form. So I'm going to write it as square root 3 squared minus parentheses 2x squared. So I'm just sort of getting it ready so it looks like thing squared minus other thing squared. Now we're going to take out two x put in u squared. What else do I have to do? Yeah, I need to find what is du. So I haven't really done calculus yet on this problem. So let's go ahead, du equals 2x derivative is 2 dx. There's that middle step. If you feel better writing that, you can write it as uh, du over dx equals 2, and then multiply by 2, uh, or multiply by dx and get down to here. So here's the middle step right here that I generally skip because you've probably done enough uh, u subs. But in case you haven't, 
that's the middle step right there. And so we have a uh, du equals 2dx. Oh, we don't have a 2dx. So we multiply, bring the half to the other side. 1 half du equals dx. And then we can rewrite it with a half outside. Integral du over square root, square root 3 minus u squared. All right, we're finally ready to use a formula. So we do a little bit of work, a little bit of algebra, and then a u sub. And this is going to equal sine inverse u over a plus c. We have that extra half hanging around, though. So it's a half times sine inverse parentheses u over a is square root 3. Your plus c can go outside the half. Or you can write it as a half c. Uh, but because you're adding uh, something and then multiplying it, you can just say I'm adding a different number. And then unsubstitute. 1 half sine inverse 2x over square root 3 plus c. I don't think there's any, any simplification you could do if u was, or if uh, a was 2 or 4 or something, you can reduce it, but that doesn't really get any better. So we get sine inverse 2x over square root 3 times a half plus c. How can you check if you're right if you have extra time to kill? Yep, so every antiderivative generally takes more time than a derivative. Depending on the antiderivative, it could take a lot more time or a little more time. I would say this one probably takes two to three times longer to uh, take the antiderivative. So usually you can check your answer way faster. All right, next problem. Antiderivative of dx divided by square root e to the 2x minus 6. So it has a square root in the denominator, so that pretty much immediately throws out the tan inverse form. This tan inverse has no square root, so that's out. The question is, is it sine or secant inverse? So they look sort of similar. They're both using subtraction in the denominator. But uh, this doesn't really fit either form. So I can't really get them both. Can I? I can get them both on the page, but they're really small. All right. One, two, or three. So it's probably not two. It's a little hard to tell if it's one or three. What do I have to change around in this example to get it to even look anything like 1 or 3? I don't even see something squared. How can I write e to the 2x as something squared? Uh, I could take square root and square it. So, so power uh, products, 2 times x, product is power of a power. So this is one of the exponential rules that you didn't forget about. That's on your cheat sheet in case you did. So powers of powers of products. So I could write it as e to the x to the 2, or e to the x squared. And if you ever have trouble, something easy like a second power, I think we'd all agree that e to the x times e to the x, e to the x squared. And what do you do with the powers? Add them together. So when in doubt, if your, one of your powers is a square, you can check it pretty easily, or a cube. It's different if your power uh, is like pi or something, you know, not an integer. OK, so we're going to use this and rewrite integral dx over square root e to the x squared minus, why did I choose 6? Let's put a, uh, let's put a 9 in there instead of a 6. So 
So I'll write it as 3 squared. All right, I just want to not have square roots if I can avoid them. Getting a little warmer. It seems like it's secant inverse, but what is still the problem? <coughs> There's nothing outside of it. That's one problem. What is another problem? Do you see e to anything in any of these forms? What can we do? We could try that. What do you do when your when your antiderivative is not a form that you can see? U substitution. There's U's all over the page. There's a reason. So your brain thinks of U sub. All right. So what is a good choice for you? All right, u to the x. All right, go ahead and make your u sub now. So you need du. Give you a hint, it's the easiest derivative there is. Plugging it back in is a little tricky. See if you can make it look like the third form, which is what it should be. Can you make this look like the third form? The du over u times square root u squared minus a squared. So I intentionally left some blanks on the board. What needs to be done is super easy, but not necessarily obvious. So what rule am I breaking right here with the du over e to the x equals dx? Don't mix. Use an x's. How can I rewrite du over e to the x without using e to the x. There we go. What is e to the x? In use, it is u. So that's not terribly obvious, but that's what we're going to be doing. So we're going to write this as du over u equals dx. So now I'm going to take out dx and drop in du over u. And this is a little bit tricky. So we have oh, du over u. Now we're breaking the you know multi-story fraction rule, so we're just going to rewrite it. This is a divided by u. I'm going to write it as a product in the denominator right there. So that was neat. It didn't look like looked like we were sort of out of luck, and then all of a sudden a u appeared because e to the x basically doesn't disappear when you take a derivative. So there was an extra e to the x. It was in the perfect spot because we picked the problem like that, so it would work out perfectly. And go ahead and finish this off. You have that it's the third secant inverse, I believe. Yeah. It's the secant inverse, and a is a nice number. And then unsubstitute your e out of e to the x at the end.
Questions? So you can check by taking derivative if you want to. All right, last problem ever until the next section. So there's one form we haven't used yet. So I'll give you a hint. We'll be using that form. I don't think I took any derivatives here as example problems. Oh no, we did a derivative sine inverse x cubed. So we did one derivative. All of them basically look exactly the same. Just some type of you know chain rule, product rule combination with the derivatives that we saw. So I can't really scroll up anymore to see the forms, but I will just write one over a squared plus u squared du equals one over a tan inverse u over a plus c. All right. What is wrong with the form that we have? Yeah. If the 4x in the middle wasn't there, I could make a nice 2x whole thing squared and be off and running. And then we'd be happy, be done pretty quick. How in the world do I turn 4x squared plus 4x plus 2? This is an algebra question. We do need to factor. So I need something squared and then plus number squared. Uh, I'll use the letter A because it's what it's going to need to be. I probably should have written the other order, but A squared plus U squared is U squared plus A squared, so you can swap the order when you're adding. How in the world do I figure out what goes in there? There's some fancy factoring. I never really called it factoring because it wasn't really factoring. I don't think it's going to factor nicely. So what if that was equal to zero and you couldn't factor it? How could you solve it? What algebra could you do? You could do a quadratic formula, but that's not an algebra. Is your final answer, team? All right, that's correct. <laughs> That felt very family feud like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna complete the square. So, unfortunately, we have a coefficient in front of x squared, too. So, we're going to factor out a 4 out of both of these. So, this is what our final uh, exp expression will look like. So, that's some easy factoring. And now, we're going to complete the square on x plus 1x. So where does this complete the square come from? x squared plus bx equals x plus b over 2 squared minus b over 2 squared. This is complete the square. All right, so that should be familiar to you. My, I know my pre-calculus classes were completing the square all the time in pre-cal one at least. I don't know if we did it so much in calc class. I don't think I've seen that since pre-cal one. Since pre-cal one? All right. Uh, if you don't believe this, you can always uh, foil out, oh no, foil out the uh, x plus b over 2 squared, and then you should see you'll get b over 2x plus b over 2x as your outside inside plus b over 2 squared, canceling the minus b over 2 squared. So these are definitely equal. So we're going completing the square now 
over here. So I'm taking half of the x coefficient. So half of 1 is 1 half squared minus 1 half squared. And then copy down the times 4 and the plus 2. I could have factored it out everywhere, but I'm going to end up multiplying it back through everything else, basically. All right, so from here, uh, I need it to look like thing squared plus number squared, so I'm going to, let's see, multiply the 4, distribute the 4. So minus a half squared is minus a fourth times 4 is 1. I'm writing equals zero. Jeez. This is not equal zero. Rookie mistake. Don't just start write equal, don't write equal zero on a side of equation, just out of habit. Alright, almost there. Minus one plus two is plus one. All right, not quite what we wanted. There is a way to get that 4 back inside the parentheses. So 4 is 2 squared. And the rule I'm going to use Is this rule you can multiply bases um, to have the same power by basically factoring out that power right there. So we can write this as uh, 2x plus 1. And that is the form we were dreaming of a while ago. Thing squared plus number squared. I know that took a while to get there. If you're super, super clever at factoring, you may have been able to factor this out right away. If you were, congratulations. It's been a year since I've seen this, so at least six months. So I, I couldn't think of that off the top of my head. All right, good news is completing the square is awesome and incredibly useful. Okay, so we just took a long algebra journey. Equals integral 2x plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. Haven't made any substitutions yet, so we're still in uh, dx. We're still in x's. Haven't talked about u's whatsoever. Uh, technically, I should write my a first and my u second. I'll just flip that around. That's not important. It's still correct the other order. All right, what do I need to do before I actually use the uh, form for tan inverse? I can see A. Need a U sub. What should U equal? 2x plus 1. There we go, 2x plus 1. It's pretty easy U sub. This part, the algebra was hard. The U sub on this one was super easy. The other problem we did, the U sub was a tricky part that we had to like sort of unsub back out. So we let U equal 2x plus 1 du equals 2dx. We don't have a 2, so we're going to use dx is 1 half du. And we're finally ready. That half can move outside. Good news is A is 1, so it won't even show up. So 1 half tan inverse U plus C, and then U is 2X plus 1. Our 
hyperbolic trig tomorrow. Good news is, so we just got through six pages. Hyperbolic trig only takes four. So it's a bit shorter. Yes, I owe you homeworks. So I will open up 7.6. Uh, I should have it open in the next hour or so.